Hello friends, welcome to another episode of my series on the serotonin system. Today we'll be talking about anxiety. You may notice I look a little bit different. I took a day off or I just continued the next day because yesterday I got quite a bit of work and I had to stop the series, uh, recording the series a bit early. So we have a few more sections to go through so that we understand uh, the gist of the research uh, in regards to how the serotonin system affects our biology and our behavior. Today we're going to be talking about anxiety. Uh, before we do, I want to show you my cool cup. I have this mug. I rarely drink coffee, but uh, this morning I happened to be drinking coffee and I thought to show you guys this mug. This mug is very interesting because it keeps the liquid either cold or hot, depending on the state of the liquid. I have no idea how it does that. It was a gift for, uh, to me from someone in Japan. It's a very nice mug. Anyway, so I've mentioned to you guys before that essentially the feeling of serotonin, of having high serotonin signaling, is a feeling of contentment. As we know, it makes mice more likely to wait for a reward. It makes people less irritable. It makes irritable people, let's say, less irritable. It makes people less aggressive. It makes people less impulsive, right? So it's a sort of calming and contentment feeling. The odd thing is it's not very easy to associate uh, anxiolysis. Remember anxiolysis? Lysis in general means lessening of something and genic means more of something. So anxiolysis is anxiety reducing or anti-anxiety if you want to be colloquial and anxiogenic is anxiety increasing anxiety, right? You'll need to know this for the video but my point is it's surprisingly not that easy to associate serotonin signaling at least at the receptors with a reduction in anxiety. Now I'm gonna tell you before I tell you the details, let me tell you a summary. Basically, actually no, I'd like you guys to find out along the way. So let's get started. The first thing is, in regard to tryptophan depletion in people, when tryptophan depletion does increase anxiety, but only when you confound the experiment with a, what's called a panicogenic agent, which is something that increases uh, anxiety or panic or adren adrenergic signaling. For example, the study I'm specifically thinking of involved yohimbine, which is actually something that athletes use quite often. So when tryptophan is reduced in the diet, tryptophan being the precursor of serotonin in the synthesis of serotonin, it's a protein, when it's reduced in the diet and yohimbine is, is introduced, people develop more anxiety than when yohimbine is introduced by itself without the tryptophan depletion. But tryptophan depletion by itself does not cause anxiety in people and Tryptophan depletion, even in obsessive compulsive disorder people, does not cause increased anxiety markers. Now, why do I mention obsessive compulsive disorder? For those that don't know, obsessive compulsive disorder is an extreme phenotype of anxiety. Um, humans, when they have unbearable levels of anxiety, they develop coping mechanisms often that involve rituals, and that's what so-called OCD really is. In fact, even the colloquial version of OCD, when someone says, I'm a bit OCD about that, Usually that relates to an anxious uh, state within the person. So it's a state that's desiring to control their environment in a way that is excessive. And also you'll find this uh, kind of you know colloquial OCD uh, phenotype develop in people who abuse, for example, uh, amphetamines like methamphetamine. They are known, for example, in California to be great cleaners. They love to clean. You, the problem is they may, you know, not all of them, but they may steal from you. You'd like to hire a methamphetamine addict to clean your house, but and I've, I've actually done that by accident before, and you'll find that they'll steal something from you as well, unfortunately, but then they'll help you look for it. So anyway, this is a bit off topic, but the point is basically when dopamine signaling or norepinephrine signaling increases, which increases the anxiety state, these the symptoms of OCD begin to develop even in the colloquial sense. Anyway, now I want to tell you about some knockout studies so we can study in mice and rodents in general so that we can understand the individual elements and potentially what they mean. So number one, if you knock out CERT, the transporter of serotonin in the synaptic cleft, which is what is inactivated by, or you know, somewhat inactivated by SSRIs, if you knock it out genetically in mice and they grow up like that, they are anxiogenic, they have higher anxiety levels. But this depends on the mouse strain, which means that CERT's effect on anxiety depends on polygenic traits and on the genetic environment of the being. Because some rodent strains do become, most of them have higher anxiety, but not all of them do. 
So this may indicate, and this shows you, by the way, this is a great example of showing you why SSRIs work for some people and not other people. You know, even within mouth strains, which by the way, no matter what people like to say, I mean, the differences between people that live across the world from different countries that haven't genetically mixed with, you know, for, I'm, I'm a biracial person, but, but for example, my two parents have very different genes, right? Because they have no relation for thousands and thousands of years. So with that said, we start to develop what's called genetic drift, which is that we move away from each other in terms of our genetics. And when that happens, like in mouse strains, the effect on the person uh, from, from some pharmacologic or genetic change depends on their actual genotype. Well, genotype just means the set of genes that a person has. So, for example, in the genetic literature, you'll frequently see, um, like, you'll see, like, uh, this allele presents with this phenotype in this race, among, for example, Africans, or among East Asians, or among Caucasians. Usually the extremities will be from East Asians or Africans. Usually those are the most uh, different. Whereas Caucasians somewhere in between. That's fr and and um, usually uh, Native Americans are somewhere between East Asians and Caucasians. But anyway, the point is, so we don't know for sure what does inactivating CERT do by itself. But it seems to increase anxiety, which is counterintuitive, right? If you think about it, but at the same time, we know that the less efficient CERT gene, the CERT gene that codes for the short allele or the LG allele, if you remember from a previous episode, actually is associated with increased anxiety specifically. That's what it's most associated with. So I guess it could make sense, but it's not intuitive because that's what the SSRI targets also, right? And we'll get into my reasoning for why probably in a future episode and a little bit at the end of this episode. The next thing I want to talk about, and I don't believe this is very relevant, but I want to tell you why, and I want to tell you what the outcome of the research is. So a lot of the research, as you know, on the genes that are involved with serotonin are on the MAOA gene, which is the monoamine oxidase A, type A gene. Monoamine oxidase, if you remember, is the enzyme that degrades serotonin in the brain. So once it's taken out of the synaptic cleft between the neurons, it's in the extracellular space, this enzyme comes and degrades serotonin, and it also degrades dopamine and norepinephrine, but other enzymes also degrade them also. So it's not um, the only one there. So when monoamine oxidase is knocked out of rodents, their anxiety increases. But this could easily be due to dopamine and norepinephrine because monoamine oxidase, that's why we don't use commonly monoamine oxidase inhibitors in humans anymore as a drug, because they inhibit the degradation of serotonin, it's not because of the difference between the synaptic cleft and degradation, but rather the fact that they inhibit the degradation of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, which means that the people have much more availability of these uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. And both dopamine and norepinephrine signal at the adrenergic receptors, which means they activate in some way the fight or flight system of the body. So, having more of those due to having a knocked out MAOA could be the reason why people have anxiety, not because of the serotonin. So this isn't that relevant, I just wanted you guys to know this. Um, another interesting thing is the PET1 transcription factor. So, when this transcript transcription factor is knocked out in mice, they lose serotonergic neurons, which means they produce less serotonin throughout their lives. And these, people have, these mice have increased anxiety. So this begins to show us that having less serotonin... Now, again, this is not very helpful because the, one has to dig into the details of this and separate the, dif the difference between developmental effects. So if you're born with less serotonergic neurons, it's different than just having lower serotonin levels uh, as an adult. So now, does that mean... Sorry, guys, uh, my camera just uh, unfortunately stopped work working, so I lost track of what I was saying. What I was trying to say is that Knocking out a gene in a rodent is not always indicative of what of just so for example knocking out some of the serotonergic genes In a rodent generally also means the rodent grows up in development with less serotonin or something else Whereas for example a human for example, this is what may happen to a human. They may encounter uh, devastating life circumstances. Remember we talked about in an earlier episode that your experiences affect your serotonin level. So you may have some devastating life circumstances. For example, you may get divorced, God forbid, or you may end up in a war, or you may lose uh, your business, you may go bankrupt, you're, something may happen to you in life. And if this happens, your serotonin level may decrease. 
So at that point, we don't really want to know what is the, in rodents, if they have low serotonin through development, how do they end up with anxiety or not? We want to know if you can shut out the gene as an adult, or if you can lower the expression of the serotonin as an adult in the rodent, what happens? You see what I mean? So actually, th this is there are ways to do this in rodents. So you can actually uh, turn off a gene in adulthood, and this has been done recently with autophagy to a little bit of uh, celebrity, actually. So... It, there are different ways to do it. So what I'm trying to say here with the PET1 transcription factor is that lower serotonin production in, uh, the loss of serotonin production in development causes uh, higher anxiety symptoms in adulthood. Now we're gonna get into more detail about this in a second. So I wanted to tell you guys briefly, other than the 5-HT2 receptors, which I'm gonna leave aside for a second, the 5-HT1 uh, B receptor, the 5-HT4 receptor, the 5-HT5A receptor, the 5-HT... I don't know how I'm going to cite all these in a row. Maybe I won't, but the 5-HT6 receptor, the 5-HT7 receptor, or maybe I'll find a paper that has all of them summarized. Anyway, <laughs> so all of these receptors, so the 5-A, which is the only 5 that really matters, the 6, the 7, the 4, and the 1-B, but we're not talking about the 1-A, which is very important, all of these receptors, so we're only missing the 5-HT3, the 5-HT2, and the 5-HT1A. Really, that's, that's very important. All of them do not present uh, with an anxious phenotype in rodents when they're removed uh, in development. Missing the 5-HT1A receptor, which I didn't list there, in before birth, like if they're genetically programmed to not have the 5-HT1A receptor before birth, they end up anxious but only if it's done before birth. If it's done in adulthood, they don't end up anxious. So basically, we've just covered everything except the 5-HT3 receptor, which it could have some impact, but let's leave that aside. The last one we're gonna talk about is the 5-HT2 receptor. The 5-HT2 receptor, so in terms of knockout, or knockout or inactivation in mice, so when the A is inactivated, anxiety reduces. When the C, the 5-HT2C, is knocked out, anxiety reduces. When the A and C are agonized, anxiety increases, and when they're antagonized, anxiolysis uh, exists. What does that mean? That means that the 5-HT2C and A, which we can't really distinguish because the agonists of A also agonize C, almost always. But and by the way, this happens because of the, the physical structure of the receptors. If the receptors are very similar, it's almost, it's almost impossible to find a molecule that will agonize one and not the other, right? But what this means is that, and, and by the way, this was known for a long time, because LSD and psilocybin mushrooms are anxiogenic, and they have a great affinity for the 5-HT2A and 5-HT2C receptors, which also seems how they create hallucination. Seems to be how they do that. So it was known for a while that these 5-HT2 receptors seem to be positively associated with anxiety. Which now, so now you're coming to this point where you're saying, okay, so only in one case really did we, or a couple of cases, did we see knockout studies that would reduce serotonergic activity and cause anxiety. And on the other hand, we see that there is a class of serotonin receptors that when they're agonized by serotonin, they increase anxiety. And a lot of the other receptors, when they're knocked out, do nothing. So does serotonin reduce anxiety? Because we know it has that feeling of contentment, makes people wait and be patient and all that. How does it do that exactly? So this is what I want to tell you. Basically, the anxiolytic effect of increasing serotonin levels in the body appears to be, it appears to be two things. There does appear to be an acute anxiolytic effect, but the research does not confirm how exactly this is done, okay? And when you completely remove parts of the serotonin system, it's not clearly evident. But we know from the receptor functions, acute means immediate, by the way, we know from the receptor functions that serotonin modulates GABA, which is a clearly anxiolytic uh, neurotransmitter, no question about it, and it modulates some of the uh, anxiogenic neurotransmitters like dopamine, norepinephrine. Um, but imagine this, the last time the memory card was full, this time the, ca the battery was, anyway. So the point is, what I was trying to say is that there is an acute effect of serotonin, in, in my opinion, that is anxiolytic, 
despite the 5-HT2A and C. Remember, serotonin has different affinities for all these different receptors and they all work differently and they all modulate other neurotransmitters differently. And we know serotonin generally modulates, I mean, these receptors modulate GABA, which is anxiolytic, and they, and they modulate anxiogenic uh, you, you know, uh, neurotransmitters like glutamate, nor, norepinephrine, as well as potentially dopamine. And I, I should make a series on dopamine one day because I feel like that's one of the most misunderstood uh, neurotransmitters. So anyway, point is, I've seen, and you can, anyone can see this, by taking 5-HTP. Uh, now, some people argue, and we don't know, some people argue that oh, if you take 5-HTP, you're probably directly causing uh, synthesis of melatonin, which is making you sleepy. And it's possible. But I feel like there's an immediate ang anxiolytic effect that can come even without the sleepiness. But the research doesn't explain exactly how that works. It's too complicated a system. But what we do know is this, the chronic anxiolytic effect from SSRIs, the consensus, and then there isn't a full consensus, but it's almost a consensus in academia, is that this is due to the neurotrophic effects of the SSRI. The neurotrophic effects which means the, the, the development of growth factors of neurons in the brain, is due to the serotonergic signaling. It is, you cannot separate the two. Serotonergic signaling produces neurotrophic effects. And many drug actions that produce neurotrophic effects depend on serotonin. So for example, uh, psilocybin, mushrooms, that's, their neurotrophic effect depends on the, the signaling at the 5-HT receptors. So essentially, in the but this happens chronically over a period of months. We'll get into that in other uh, other um, videos later. The point is, what you, the takeaway from this video is that it is not so simple to associate serotonin with an anxiolytic effect. But my personal opinion is that there is an acute anxiolytic effect that depends on the mod modulation of other neurotransmitter systems, which we can see from other other our other discussions. I mean, we talked about specific neurotransmitter systems when I discussed the individual receptors, but we also talked about how SSRIs, for example, when we're talking about drugs and addiction, how SSRIs limit, uh, reduce the dopaminergic effects of drugs and the dopaminergic drive. And, uh, you know, so we, we can see the modulation of the other systems. And in a chronic use of, a ser of higher serotonin signaling, neurotrophic uh, factors develop. And we're going to talk about those in a future video, which will be, I think, quite interesting. Thank you for bearing with me, despite the uh, faulty technology, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.